Persian poet Hafiz writes, how did the rose ever open its heart and give to this world all its beauty? It felt the encouragement of the light against its being. Otherwise, we all remain too frightened. Let me read that again. How did the rose ever open its heart and give to this world all its beauty? It felt the encouragement of the light against its being. Otherwise, we all remain too frightened. So what do we need to be able to burn away our fear so that we can open our hearts and be all we were born to be? Where do we find the encouragement of light in our lives? What inspires our inner rose to open and unfurl its wings? In a world that can often be frightening, harsh, or overwhelming, it's easy to feel closed down, disheartened, cynical, or fearful. It's easy to lose hope and experience life as an endless struggle. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the many problems facing humanity during these challenging times in which our earth is rapidly being destroyed and people are immeasurably cruel to one another. The enormity of the world's problems can weigh heavily on our souls, can't they? So how do we find the encouragement of the light to overcome our fears so that we too can radiate our beauty to this world. As Hafiz suggests, it's precisely now, precisely now during times of fear that we need intentionally to seek the encouragement of the light. What is this light, this beauty that we should turn towards? What is this thing that nourishes our spiritual courage? It reminds me of some house plants that no matter where you put them in your house, they'll turn to grow in the direction of the light. In fact, the plant that you gave me for my birthday last year, which lives in my office, knows nothing other than to grow toward the light. I can move it, and I do, so that all the leaves face inward toward the interior of my office. And within a day or so, all the leaves turn and grow towards the window. It seeks the light because it knows on a cellular level it will grow strong and beautiful by turning towards it, even if it has to stretch a little. Now, there are millions of ways to make the world more beautiful. But the first step is to seek what's beautiful. Seek the luminous, the vision that you hold for your heart and life. Ron McNair did just that. He was born in 1950 in the small town of Lake City in South Carolina in the midst of segregation and Jim Crow laws. He believed a more beautiful world was possible. As a small child, Ron had a passion for books, for science, for space and airplanes. And at the age of nine, Ron wanted to read and learn all he could about those subjects. But there was a problem. African-American kids weren't allowed to check out books from the library. Can you believe it? So one day, taking all his courage in hand and keeping his attention clearly on his vision of a better future, Ron walked the mile to his local library. He found some exciting books about planes and space. And as he walked up to the counter, the librarian told him, you can't check these out, it's against the rules. A kindly white woman in the line next to him told him she'd check them out for him. But Ron refused. The rule made no sense. He was a reliable kid and would take care of them and would return them in time. He wanted the opportunity to read them lying under an old oak tree, looking up at the sky and watching planes fly by. So Ron 
jumped up on the librarian's desk and said he wasn't going to move until he could check out these books. The librarian called the police and his mother to have him removed. But when the policemen arrived, they took pity on this determined little boy and suggested that the librarian give him a library card anyway. And when Ron's mother arrived, she vouched that he would take good care of the books. And eventually, the librarian conceded and allowed him to check out his precious books. To Ron, these books made all the difference. He went on to become valedictorian of his school. He played saxophone and became a fifth degree black belt in karate. From there, he got a PhD in physics at MIT and eventually became only the second African-American astronaut. Ron suffered numerous setbacks along the way, such as people stealing two years of his work in specialized laser physics and being one of 10,000 applicants to NASA for a space mission. But Ron let nothing stand in the way of his dreams. He stayed focused on the more beautiful world he knew was possible a world in which the same opportunities would be available to all, no matter the color of their skin. He married the love of his life, Cheryl Moore, and became a father to two children, Reginald and Joy. Ron's childhood library was named after him 25 years after he checked out his first book. He changed access to knowledge for African-American children after him. And Ron said, my wish is that we would allow this planet to be the beautiful oasis that she is and allow ourselves to live more in the peace she generates. It's not hard to love this man and his story, is it? Which makes his untimely death at the age of 35 more than a little tragic. But Ron died doing what he loved. In 1986, Ron was on the Challenger mission. And sadly, most of us know how that turned out. If here today, I'm sure Ron would rather be remembered for the doors he opened to libraries and to space for people of color. He was an inspiring example of what can happen when you focus on the beauty you see can be possible in the world. He didn't allow the world or stagnant ways of thinking to frighten or constrain him. Ron kept turning toward the direction and encouragement of the light in his heart. It's Father's Day. And in honor of the many beautiful fathers in and beyond these walls, I share the story of Chris Gardner. His life was depicted by Will Smith in the film Pursuit of Happiness. Chris Gardner endured a challenging childhood without his father around. He had an abusive stepfather who beat him regularly. His mother was imprisoned and his beloved uncle who helped raise him and was his only positive father figure drowned in the Mississippi River when Chris was only nine years old. As a result, Chris ended up in the endless cycle of foster care. Yet determined to make a life for himself, Chris found small jobs here and there to make ends meet. And later, during a failing relationship with his wife, Gardner had an affair and had a son with his mistress. He became the single parent to his son, Christopher Jarrett Gardner Jr., and struggled mightily to raise the child by himself. Enduring bouts of homelessness in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, they slept on the floor of BART station bathrooms, in hotels, parks, airports, and buses. His son remembers constantly having to move from place to place with no regular bed to sleep in. But Gardner's dedication to making a better life for his son and himself kept him focused. Let's see a brief moment between the two of them from the movie. Yeah, a GoPro! Oh. <laughs> a GoPro! Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know, you know, uh, 
you'll probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average. You know, so, whoa. So you'll probably ultimately rank somewhere around there, you know, so I really, you'll excel at a lot of things, just not this. I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night, all right? All right. Okay? All right, go ahead. let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. Dad. Now that's what makes a great father, doesn't it? Someone who's willing to own their mistakes and put them right. And as he said to his son, if you want something, go get it. And that's what Chris Gardner did. Thankfully, his fortune ended up changing when he met a stockbroker broker by chance who taught him the financial business. Now, Gardner had to work for free to learn his new trade while living on the streets, but he was determined to provide for his son and change the broken legacy of his youth. Meanwhile, Glide Memorial Church allowed him and his son to sleep there while he was doing his internship. And with tremendous, tremendous grit and determination, Gardner kept working for the more beautiful world he knew was possible for his son. Holding his dream close and never giving up, he eventually started his own brokerage firm and became extremely successful, ending up with building a multi-million dollar business. And he's now a consultant, inspirational speaker, and philanthropist who creates low-income housing and employment opportunities for the homeless. Dedicated to the well-being of children, in 2002, Gardner received the Father of the Year Award from the National Fatherhood Initiative. So I thought it was only fitting to celebrate him today. Another story that speaks to me strongly, not about fathers in this case, but of someone who believed that the world could be a better place, comes from New Zealand. Their new prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, has just instituted a radical new way of governing. Rather than preparing a budget as usual, their young millennial female prime minister has called for a budget that encourages the well-being of all its citizens. The budget is slated to move away from the traditional bottom line measures like productivity and economic growth, and instead focus on goals like community and cultural connection and equity in well-being across all generations. The well-being of all its citizens is its focus. Can you imagine? They aim to improve mental health, reduce child poverty, address the inequities faced by their indigenous population. They aim to thrive in a digital age and transition to a low emission, sustainable economy. Collaboration and co-creation will be the way these policies take shape as opposed to at the hands of lobbyists and siloed politicians. It's a mission-driven budget, as opposed to one dictated by money. Now, if that's not creating a more beautiful world, I don't know what is. And she's leading the way in so many ways. So what 
do all these stories have in common? I believe that in each case, despite the many challenges they faced, these people believed a more beautiful world was possible. It allowed them to shed their fear and let their vision of beauty win. So I ask you, where do you find the light that nourishes? What helps you unfurl your wings? What inspires you to make the world more beautiful? Where do you find that light? Now, the 17th century French mathematician, inventor, and theologian Blaise Pascal said, in difficult times, carry something beautiful in your heart. And this is what I'm asking us to do, to intentionally turn towards the light and beauty that inspires us. Imagine going up on a balcony and looking down at what's below you. You can, of course, look at the dark alleyway on the side of the house. Rats are scampering, garbage cans are knocked over, trash lying around. Not a pretty place to give your attention to. Or you can face the other direction and look at your beautiful garden filled with fresh smelling roses. It's up to you where you focus your attention. I actually lived in an apartment exactly like that in London for many years. If I looked in one direction, I would see a dirty, trash, and urine-filled alleyway where rats gathered. But if I turned and looked the other way, I could see my garden, where I had planted flowers and shrubs and things of beauty. No doubt you'll want to look at the alleyway from time to time to plan what needs to be done there, if you can. But I think we need to look at the garden even more. Give attention and gratitude to the beautiful side of life for balance and optimism. You'll need that inspiration when you go to clean up the dirty alleyway. So where, my friends, do you find the beauty that you know nourishes you? Look towards what's working and what's beautiful in your life. Think about what makes you come alive, what brings you joy. Shift your perspective from what's bad and wrong to what's beautiful. Now, for some of us, that may mean spending more time in nature, hiking, birding, gathering, gardening, walking, or camping. Others fill their hearts through their connection to spirit within or beyond them, doing spiritual practices such as meditation, prayer, or reading sacred writings. Some find their beauty through connection and relationship, whether it's with one other beloved, with their family, or with a community like this one, for example. Yet others find their beauty through learning and growth, by reading a new book, seeing an inspiring movie, or beholding the beauty of a sleek mathematical formula. I know there are some of you in here who love that. Some will find beauty in their own physicality and the sensations of their body through movement, exercise, making love or dancing. And for others, it will be through expressing their creativity, through making art of some kind, whether it's painting, crocheting, making mosaics, throwing pots, singing or writing poetry. There are a million different ways to fill our hearts with beauty. I invite you to find what it is for you. Seek what fills you with delight so that you can hold strong in your vision of creating a more beautiful world. This is what we need now. Don't get stuck on the alleyway. Let beauty lure your attention. Let it beckon you. Let it inspire you. Turn toward it again and again, because the work you do in the world will be so much greater if you can do that. The 
TV presenter and speaker, Jason Silva, says, awaken yourself to our common ecstasy. Go chase beauty. May beauty be the fertilizer that feeds your roots and allows your leaves to unfurl. And may the beauty all around us give you more courage and resilience for the journey of life. May it be so. Amen.